Hey everybody, I'm Pastor AJ Houseman and welcome to 10 Foot Pole, a podcast to dig deeper into aspects of the Bible that get glossed over or totally ignored in most preaching. The Bible has a lot of parts that are racy, uncomfortable, and sometimes downright horrifying. Let's talk about it. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 3. Uh, our guest today is the Reverend Jason Chestnut, who is a mission developer in North Carolina and really just ultimate uh, freelance filmmaker, preacher, and storyteller. I really love the title of like freelance preacher. Yeah. Uh, shout out to the Methodist circuit riders. That's how it feels sometimes. Mm. Huh. Plus, well, I, I would like to learn how to ride a horse. So I'm, I'm serious about that. Okay. <laughs> I love the Pound circuit riders. Pound town on your horse. <laughs> That's right. People waiting six to eight weeks to have communion. No. Do you know what's interesting to me about riding horses? Um, is I feel like it, this is, it's a very specific thing that like once upon a time, this was like your major mode of transportation, like everyone did it. And now it's like horses are for rich people. For real. I mean, that may have always been true a little bit. Like you would have at least have to have enough money to own a horse. Everyone else just walked around on foot. Right. Yeah. But, um, I also think, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you're, you're I think you're especially right now because, to even have access to a horse, you got to be pretty rich. I know there are ways, right? Like I do know people that, that are, that are into horseback riding that like, I don't know how they do it that aren't super rich. Um, so like, it's possible. I just, that's what I associate in my mind is like, Oh, you're into horses, rich people. Listen, all like I, the I mean, queen. yeah, the queen or like just the whole, uh, sport called dressage. I mean, yeah. It's rich. It's rich white people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyways, a little off topic. It just say uh, you made me a uh, think of that. <laughs> I live Our my life off topic. Today, though, yes. I live my life. Our topic Pastor today, Richard. though, um, yes. about the Bible. Uh, we're going to talk about the Psalm. We haven't jumped into the Psalms in a while, and I thought, you know, it it is Advent, uh, and you know, normally we just really like to focus on the Jesus thing, but let's break it up a little bit. Let's talk about some other things that God might be up to in the Advent season. Um, so we're going to talk about the Psalm uh, for Sunday, December 11th, which is Advent 3, for those that are following the Revised Common Lectionary. And it is Psalm 146, verses 5 to 10, because for some reason, 10 verses was too long to read on Sunday. Right? It's a it's a short psalm. Just do the whole, whole thing. Right. <laughs> and it's not like like the verses that aren't included, like it's not like they're irrelevant or anything, you know. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to God all my life. Nope, we wanted to leave those out. So Yeah, and especially the like the do not put your trust in princes in mortals. Yeah. Uh because I th- I feel like uh today we're told to put our trust in people who have money Ooh. or people who have power, you know, and I'm like, I mean, like, no, the opposite the psalmist is like, no, I feel like a lot of times the Psalms, uh, paint a picture of God where they're like, yep, God is powerful, but not like, not the power that you think, right. God is merciful, but not like you think. Yeah. I love it. Very, you're right though. Like very uh, much of the Psalms. And I think that's actually like, you know, even much of the story of Jesus, right. Is contrasting what it means yes. to have this kind of power, this kind that is merciful and love um, and, you know, loving kindness versus the kind of power that we see in our mortal leaders. Mm-hmm. That's I, I think Abs- a significant chunk of it is that, is that contrast all the time? Yes. Yes. Which makes it even more heartbreaking when today I see a lot of people of faith kind of interchange God and like powerful people. Yeah. Yeah. Or, well, hey, or rich people. Mm-hmm. Well, let's uh, let me read the Psalm and then, you know, we'll dive into that is what does this mean? This kind of power that we're contrasting with these princes, right? Mm -hmm. Psalm 46, 5 to 10, 146. Happy are the, oh, I'm also reading the uh, version from the Evangelical Lutheran Worship Hymnal. 
because uh, that's what preloads on Sundays and seasons. So nice. Oh, I don't um, think it's that indistinguishable from the NRSV. It's it's not. Um, other than I think that the the tetragrammatons aren't capitalized. Good word, Pastor. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Little hair flip. Uh, okay. <laughs> Happy are they who have the God of Jacob for their help, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the seas and all that is in them, who keeps promises forever, who gives justice to those who are oppressed and food to those who hunger. The Lord sets the captive free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord cares for the stranger. The Lord sustains the orphan and widow, but frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, throughout all generations. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm. Okay, so it's not that close to the NRSV. It's uh, they they uh, that's interesting, but it's very. I just, I, I, I don't know how it feels to you, AJ, but that the Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. All I think about is Luke chapter four, when Jesus gives his first, you know, uh, inaugural sermon and he quotes from Isaiah, but the oh. spirit of the Lord is upon me to bring good news to the poor, yep. to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set the prisoners free and proclaim the year of economic justice. So I feel like there's a lot of echoes there. Well, there's a lot of echoes, right? Like this is what, you know, when we talk about this God using power for for mercy and for justice and what that means, um, you know, we have what I call the big seven. You know, we have, you know, the, the, where are they here? Our big seven, the hungry, the oppressed, the stranger, the orphan, the widow, the prisoner, and the disabled. Every time you hear Jesus talk about the same, the same seven, we hear it in Isaiah, we hear it echoed everywhere. Like this, this is not only what this God does is gives this kind of liberation, but it's also then what we have been tasked to do. And that I think is the incredible hard part. Yeah, it is. Um, But it's exactly what you, what, what you, what you're saying. It's not just, I mean, the, the, the big seven I love that, by the way. The big seven is not just it's it's um, to care for them, to to focus on them, to lift them up, to liberate them. It's not just God's standard. Mm-hmm. It is it is like I I would say especially through the person of Jesus of Nazareth, it becomes our work too. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that and, is and, that's you know, powerful. It is very powerful. And I think that like, you know, us coming from a a particularly, you know, Lutheran perspective, what we say is, you know, Jesus gave us this gift of grace and our job is to live in response to it. Well, that's exactly what this is. Our our living in response to the gift of, of, you know, uh, God through Jesus Christ is doing this work of caring for the big seven. Yeah. And that, that um, I just think that, because Jesus brings it up several times, you can tell that like Jesus was reading the same stuff mm-hmm. in the Hebrew scriptures and it was affecting him too. And, yeah, and, and that was the, you know, his point to, to echo, I think what the Psalm says here, right. The echo, the story, uh, you know, the, the same words in Isaiah of that, like, Hey, this is what mortal princes do. This is what your King, this is what your Caesar does. This, however, is what God does. And this is what we are to follow. Amen. And that's yeah. a, and that's a problem, you know, for a lot of people, we talked about last week in the, you know, sort of the story of John the Baptist is the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming forward to talk to John the Baptist, um, you know, that they're like, oh, I guess we got to get on board with this, right? Like, they're still like challenging it, right? Because they're living in a different system than is trying to be proclaimed. Mm. Which, 
is not that far, I think, echoing from where we kind of sit today, right? Like, I think that there is an incredible split in Christianity, the same way that we saw these different sects of, of Judaism in our biblical stories sort of butting heads on things. And so which oh, side absolutely. are we on? Where do you where do you sit on? Are we on, you know, are we a follower of Jesus? Or are we really actually a forerunner of one of these other groups of Christians that like our scriptures would butt up against? Hmm. That's a fascinating, that's a fascinating understanding. I think it's also just very relevant uh, because of the, I mean, there are just, there are people in, in this country, AJ, people who look like us and, and talk like us, who, who say that they're Christian and have an entirely different view of what it means to follow Jesus. Yeah. And that, and that's honestly what, uh, it's kind of scary. Oh, it's terrifying. It's terrifying. And I think it, 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 it kind of falls on us to, to proclaim what, what God and what God through Jesus has done. But specifically in the Psalms, we don't, we don't spend a lot of time in the Psalms. We might sing them. Mm -hmm. If you're lucky, you might sing them, but generally speaking, they kind of, uh, we, we kind of gloss over them and, you know, from a Lutheran perspective, good old brother Martin called them a small Bible, like a, like a mini, a miniature Bible. And he was saying that in a sense of like, like you could just have the Psalms and that, and that could almost take the place of the biblical scriptures. Yeah, well, the Psalms are designed that they, um, I mean, they do kind of fit together that they tell the, they, they are meant to like sort of tell the, the story of God's relationship with God's people within this this certain set. Right. Um, like, you know, uh, Psalms 1 and 2, um, you know, the story of creation and stuff like that are, are built into those. And then how the Psalms right. are sort of designed that they go from lament to praise, right? That we, you know, struggle in the relationship and then ultimately we end in, in praise for God. Um, but in this Psalm, even here in Psalm 146, you know, um, it's sort of designed, we identify God, like what, what's going on in the story. So we identify God as, you know, this is the God of Jacob, the God who made the heavens and the earth. Got it. Okay. We know exactly who we're talking about. And what did this God do? Well, this God keeps promises forever. This God gives justice. This God gives food. This God sets the captive free. You know, this is, we're, we're identifying and saying, this is what this God does. And then we give praise for them. Yeah, no, absolutely. But I mean, uh, sometimes I think we might, we sometimes these suffer from familiarity. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it says here, the Lord sets the prisoners free. Well, AJ. That's a rough one. Like. The people in prison, they deserve to be there, I've been told. And so there's no, like, mm. what is this about? So what's interesting, uh, this is why I love the conversations about the, you know, sort of the big seven, as I call it, is I think there's some that, like, we easily get on board with. Feed the hungry, great. Go down to your soup kitchen. Obviously, take care of the widow, the mm. orphan. Those are the easy ones. Mm. Duh. Um, the disabled a little bit harder, um, but we're getting better at, I think. Um, and then the two that I think the toughest here, right? The prisoner and the stranger. Um, the word for stranger in Hebrew is ger, uh, which is a, a resident alien, a foreigner, an immigrant, um, a newcomer, someone who is not of your particular race or ethnicity or country origin living in your space. Hmm. That's a tough one. But the prisoner, as you as you call this, is literally someone who is imprisoned. You know, um, I think the version that I read called it the captive because it's easier. That's I think that's really kind of like churchy language when we hear like you know mm. set the captive free that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. Right, right. And, and I I really do think that translators put that in there because it separates a little bit from the uncomfortableness mm. of like no, this is literally someone who's sitting in a prison cell. Right, right, um, and to. And to and to empty the prisons, mm. uh, that well, sounds just too dangerous. It, so dangerous um, and unfair 
to all those people who aren't in prison? Why are you going to pay off student debt? I already paid mine off. That's unfair, right? Like, I think a lot of times we run across uh, God's amazing grace and we're like, that's not fair. I mean, yeah, that if I it's get that fair. grace, it's good. <laughs> that's it. It's not fair. One of my favorite uh, quotes of all time is from a Reliant K song. And it says, the beauty of grace is that it makes life not fair. Hmm. The amount of times that I have preached on that, it just, it, it is, that sums it up just so perfectly. It's not fair. Um, neither yeah. is the American industrial prison system. And Preach. that's just our, our country. I'm not, you know, in, into understanding so much other prison systems. No, uh, but like we, we imprison more people than China. And China has pretty close to a police state. Yeah. And we imprison more people than they do. And they also have like a billion more people. I mean, I think that's a sobering real recognition of the kind of mass and carceral state that we live in that I think this Psalm uh, speaks a word into. Can I, um, to add a resource, um, and I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about it, uh, because I know that you you can. Um, A good resource to kind of talk about what sort of Jason and I are alluding here to is uh, the new Jim Crow. Michelle Alexander. Yes. Um, Jason, can you tell us like what what is Jim Crow, and then um, what is New Jim Crow? Would you be oh man share that? Sure, succinctly uh, or you know as however you like to. Well, I think uh, the best way to see it visually is to watch Childish Gambino's music video called "This Is America." Oh, okay, where he at the beginning he's in a Confederate he's wearing Confederate army style trousers. And he does the, it was a minstrel show character done by a white man in blackface called Jumpin' Jim Crow. Mm. And it was a way in the late 18th, early night or late 19th, early 20th century to do what white people have done with black people since the beginning of this country and before, which is to make fun of them Mm. and to imagine that they are not as intelligent and not as well, not as human. And so when the when the 13th and 14th and 15th amendments to the Constitution were passed, slavery, quote unquote, was abolished, except in in cases of a crime or in cases of punishment for a crime. Watch Ava DuVernay's 13th mm-hmm. uh, fantastic, sobering documentary. I believe available on Netflix. Yes. And uh, I don't even think you have to have Netflix to watch it. I think it's uh, streams for free there. But oh, um, nice. so when the South was deprived of their primary economic system of chattel slavery, the they tried to figure out other ways to oppress, demonize, uh, and otherwise uh, put down black people, and so. They started to pass what they call, what at the time was called black codes. They came up with brand new, uh, brand new crimes like loitering. Mm-hmm. So you couldn't just be standing around without a job. Well, guess what? There were 4 million recently freed black people who didn't have jobs. Trying to figure and it so, out. What's that? They're just trying to figure it out. My God. And so they just, so, so it's like, it was little by little and, you know, reconstruction figures big into this. Um, and once the, the troop, once the, once the federal troops left the South, uh, they, they, in many, in many instances, they, they committed coup d'etats. They had violent insurrections to overcome democratically elected Mm-hmm. multiracial democracy hopefully that sounds familiar to us today um so they did that in several places went to north carolina new orleans they got all white by the way they called themselves redeemers aj they saw this as a redemption very strong religious language yeah. and then they brought well, in all you'll white find, yeah you'll i was gonna say you'll find that a lot the the religious ties to um the justification of this oppression right right and so anyways uh I, long long story longer they just created as many laws as they could to basically 
put black people into another tier of society, a, a lesser tier. And it was it was apartheid in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. And they called it Jim Crow. And so that was different. What's the origin of that term? Do you know? Well, I think it was this this blackface character called Jumpin' Jim Crow. Okay. And then it was like, for I don't know exactly how that 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 shifted, but but whatever that Jumpin' Jim Crow who would like eat watermelon and just yeah. run around the stage as an idiot, like they use that, and 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 so in some ways it it just made sense to use that as a name anyway. So so there's this whole system. Jim Crow, which gave, I mean, uh, early Nazis in Germany, they were inspired mm. by the way the United States, Southern states treated black people. And so that was Jim Crow, right? And lasted basically from the end of slavery until, you know, the middle of the 20th century. It's about 100 years. Right. This is after chattel slavery for the 250 years before that. Mm -hmm. And once the, the, the civil rights movement of the 1950s and sixties, once that kind of uh, destroyed the systematic Jim Crow, then what Michelle Alexander argues is that the mass mass incarceration then started to take, take its place in this line. Mm -hmm. So then it was all like we couldn't have specifically racist laws anymore in the South. And so we figured out how to uh, incarcerate black people and make them. All of this is just a every 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 part of this through the centuries is just different ways of making it illegal to be black. Mm. So that's the, I, I highly recommend that book. Um, in fact, you could just read the, the preface to that book and it and really kind of, so much. It, puts a, it puts it into perspective to recognize that today in, in, our, in our present day, there are more black people in jail than during the time of Jim Crow, mm-hmm. which the new system. Right. Which, so, um, you know, uh, something that kind of goes, uh, a, a new law in, um, Illinois, it, it passed, I believe, um, the, oh shit, what's it called? I wrote it down. Oh, the pretrial fairness act. Right. Oh my God. Um, Incredible. so this is a, this is a new thing. So typically what happens if someone were to, to get arrested, then they would, uh, you know, this whole system that we claim that you're innocent until proven guilty does not apply to typically uh, persons of color um, and poor people. Um, because right. what happens in our system is that you get arrested and then you would have a bail hearing where the judge would decide, based on what you're accused of doing, how much money that they think um, that you should pay to not have to sit in a jail cell before your actual trial begins. So Which you could be been- months away. Or it can be, yes, months. Um, some of them are up to years, especially with how things have been delayed with uh, COVID, especially. Um, and where you're, what circuit you're in, like where, like if you're in a particularly like um, busy place and cities and things like that, it can be much longer. Right. Um, and so if you, uh, they, they set this amount of money and said, you know, even though you haven't actually been convicted of a crime yet, you need to pay this amount of money if you don't want to sit in a jail cell. Um fine for people with means right. um so if you don't have means and particularly also if you don't have means which means you probably don't have very good lawyer for using a public defender right um and you don't have the money right like you um would sit in a jail cell until your trial date um like you re- said regardless you could be you know, innocent yes it also hinders you from being able to like, you know, do build a good case and things like that. It's not like you have like a whole legal counsel while you're sitting in a jail cell. It actually makes that a lot harder for you to communicate with, with your legal and all that kind right. of stuff. Um, and so particularly, this is a thing that is kind of, uh, that's popped up in the American legal system that uh, aids, um, this new Jim Crow, right. That like, absolutely, um, if you can afford, 
if you can pay for it, you don't have to yeah. sit in jail. But if you can't pay for it, you do have to sit in jail. Which is effectively what you just described. That is, and what Illinois finally passed a law to to dismantle. Mm-hmm. But what you just described is being in jail for being poor. Yeah. That's that the only what, reason yeah. that thousands upon thousands now, I also rot this in jail cells. Yes. And so I also want to say for people who are like, well, what if someone murdered someone? They should totally not be able to run rampant on the streets. Yes, there actually are exceptions for uh, violent crimes and those uh, those kind of especially violent crimes with overwhelming evidence. You're right. Those people will continue to sit in a jail cell without bail. That is still a thing. That didn't go away. What right. this means is, is someone who... Um, what's a good... Was- was uh what's a good example of like someone who maybe robs a convenience store yeah or or, or is accused suspected, of whether they did it suspected yeah, of suspected robbing of right of ro- and, and they fit the profile yeah and so somebody like Khalif browder hmm. is thrown into rikers and he hasn't done anything and he sits there for months years finally gets out eventually kills himself rest in peace Khalif. And we still don't know. It's likely he didn't do anything. Mm-hmm. And, and that happens a lot, right? That, yeah, it's a, it's, it's, it's a sadistic piece of our criminal, quote unquote, justice system. And it's really powerful. That Illinois also you know, legalized marijuana and expunged the records of the thousands of people who are who are in jail because of marijuana possession back in the yeah you know the war on drugs yeah the war on drugs exactly how many how many people sat in jail because of marijuana right right where where today we know that if you're suffering from cancer marijuana can be an amazing gift to you um and where we have an entire epidemic for uh, Oxycontin, which was never illegal, right? Yeah. And so I, I, th- I think I, I think it just kind of... Uh, well, you in- also get into a little bit of, I, I think, it's not as much anymore, but like there also is a difference between like white collar drugs um, and, you know, poor people drugs too. And totally. what is being criminalized and where they're coming from, right? Like Oxycontin comes from a doctor. Exactly. Exactly. Or even in the midst of the war on drugs in the Reagan era, that if you had a certain amount of cocaine, you could have you could have bigger amounts of cocaine and 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 not get as strong of a prison sentence. But if you had crack Mm. cocaine, which was predominantly in black communities, just even a little bit, and you could have three strikes, you're out, you're behind bars for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Because somebody gave you some. That you're like, and and then they find it in your car. I mean, it's well, but I mean, just just like to... naming that is like, oh, people are like, oh, like not realizing that, like, even just the differences in which drugs are criminalized and how they're criminalized is aids into this racist system, right? Right. So, um, you know, the Lord gives justice. Yeah, the NRSV and uh, it says executes justice. Ooh, I like that. Executes justice for the oppressed. Um, yeah, that's just a fascinating word, isn't it? Yeah. And that justice must be executed. Not people, justice. Mm-hmm. I think that's powerful. I also just see a lot of this um, verses six, seven, eight, nine. That uh, you know, uh, it, it's Isaiah fifty-eight. It's Exodus twenty-one uh, chapters twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three. So it's in the Torah. It's in Isaiah, which Martin Luther called the fifth gospel, <laughs> and then we see it continuously through the gospels because mm-hmm. jesus keeps bringing it up yep the big seven i just think there's something about that plus seven is such a great holy number yeah yeah i didn't even think about that i just like always it's always it's it's always the same 
right? Like if you continually look through the scripture, these are the ones that we continually hear that this God of Jacob, this God who created the heavens and the earth, this God shows preference and makes it very clear that in in their power, they give love and justice and liberation to these people, that those are the focus of this story. If you want to talk about people, you know, as uh, Jason mentioned earlier, some people call the Bible God's love letter to God's people. Well, this is it. This is the love that this God is showing over and over and over and over again. That our yes. God says, these are the people. This is what yes. it means to, this is the love, this is the love letter. Yeah, you know how sometimes love letters um, or how we we tell people in love things that maybe we don't really want to hear, but we need mm. to hear because it's love. It's in love. Hey, these are the people you need to be caring about. These are the people that I care about. Gustavo Gutierrez, a liberation theologian, said yeah. that God has a preferential option for the poor. Mm -hmm. We hear it in Mary's song when she's preggers with Jesus, right? Like Yes, which is the all alternate psalm for the day. Uh, uh, Luke 2. My soul proclaims your greatness, O Lord. My spirit rejoices in you. For you have looked with love on the lowly. I'm not even reading it. I can't find it. I can't pull it up fast enough. <laughs> I thought you were. <laughs> Keep going. I, if I sing it, I can usually. Uh, you, yeah, right. But you bring the low. You, uh, you lift you, up the lowly. Um, you scatter the. the you proud cast the mighty. The I found it. You cast the mighty down from their thrones and lift up the lowly you have filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty you have come to the aid of your servant israel to remember the promise of mercy the promise made to our forebears to abraham and his children forever there's that promise language again but also i can i can imagine uh you know mary singing that today and people saying well what's wh well not all rich people right mm -hmm not all powerful people <laughs> and that because it's it's just a little too uncomfortable right to think about especially for those that that profit on the the prosperity gospel right that you absolutely. have churches yes. with incredible churches i'd say quote unquote because a lot yes. of them actually aren't legally churches um uh have incredible wealth yeah and i and i <laughs> I just think that I think about um, the good news that Jesus brings doesn't always sound so good to those who have power and those who have privilege. It's going to sound like they're going to lose a lot of that, which they might, they will, because God's beloved community requires things to change, right? Right. That's the, the, the kingdom that we're working on, supposedly. <laughs> yeah, and, and when Isaiah talks about the peaceable kingdom, Isaiah says the lion will lie down with the lamb. El Dowd says in Baptized and Tear Gas that this requires the lion to stop being a lion. Mm. Yeah, that's a good line. And I think... There's that 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 can extend to us too, who are struggling with these texts to say we have privilege that we can leverage for justice as well, right? There are yeah. things that we can do that 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 bring about that that beloved community. Well, that builds, I think, also in what we were talking with uh, last week with Pastor Kelsey about um, this this idea of what repentance is. That repentance requires you to change, and then how do you how do you use use that change? So, what does that look like? So, we had talked about voting. That that's a big way that you can exercise um, what it is to make changes in these systems of these systems of oppression. But that you just named, right? Like we have the privilege. Um, especially those of us um, that are particularly white, um, we have a privilege that we can leverage in order to make changes to these systems. 
But right. if we are the lions, right? Like say and name it. Probably yes. The white people, especially in a capitalist society like the United States, are quite most most of the time, um, at least middle and upper class, um, are the lions, right? And so, what does that mean for us to lay that down? Right, 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 right. And I think it requires a shit ton of introspection. Yeah. Of of self-examination right like uh shout out to alcoholics anonymous and their fearless moral inventory Mm. i think i think there's just a lot of christians especially in our country that are obsessed with this with all these different specs you know (laughs) a spec that uh happy holidays instead of merry christmas just these tiny little specs everywhere and we forget we completely miss this huge log (laughs) in our face this 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 like racism and sexism and transphobia that just just blinds us Mm -hmm. from from this broken and beautiful world that god calls us to care for right Mm. yeah i also think that you just kind of named that we sort of then focus i i think in a lot of uh christian churches and denominations um you know including our own um we've we've we're focusing on the wrong things right like uh, yeah i mean yeah the church is obsessed with sex it is absolutely obsessed with sex all all churches all 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 of them then my your denomination all of them super obsessed with it yeah, they are. And uh, I just want to say, have you read the Song of Songs? Um, do you believe that it's in racy. Genesis chapter... What's that? It's racy. <laughs> yeah. Do you believe in, in the first chapters of Genesis that God created everything and called it good? Called mm-hmm. it very good? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't... Th- sometimes I just don't think we take God seriously enough. <laughs> Ooh. That's a, I I like the way you phrase that because yeah you're right. Mm. Well and I, well and we don't take I mean a part of that is a shout out to uh, Marcus. Do we Ford. do we think that we're like we're smarter than God right like clearly God you were wrong. Clearly God you were wrong and we think we know better than God and sh- and, and and God didn't mean that exactly like not God doesn't mean to empty the jails God only meant to free the the deserving incarcerated right yeah there's none of those there's there's no there's no side there's no asterisks in this at all i yeah you i think you nailed it directly on the head and that's the part that i think is so offensive about the bible right there are no asterisks we have created those later in in the system of in the yes. system of our version of morality, right? Yes. Um, I love talking about uh, morality and ethics uh, because it's a moving target. I think what like most mm. people have is what set what they think in their mind, um, especially those that live in a very black and white understanding of the world um, that will crumble if you start to poke at it at all. Um, because the truth of the matter is, is like our our moral reality is subjective Hmm. the way that what we think is right and wrong is totally subjective based on our each our own individual perspectives of the world um Hmm. particularly maybe what religion that you were raised in um can make a huge difference to what what that looks like where you were raised what your social class was what the color of your skin is like all of those things give us what we believe you know what what our what our true moral compass to be right and Hmm. so it's a problem if if it's too black and white because the world doesn't exist that way Mm. yeah i don't even remember why i started going down this little rant um well i think i think you're right on with um with a discussion on morality because there's a group in colorado springs called focus on the family Mm. that seems to be really they've kind of prided themselves on being these moral compasses. And yet what do they mostly export hate for queer people? Mm -hmm. And we saw that at club Q. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so I think, I think you're right on talking about how ethics and morality really is a moving target. We don't like to think of it that way. We think it's set in stone. Yeah, because it's uncomfortable to think that like, oh, the world... Because I, I think that like the 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 framework of a lot of people's worlds will totally break down if you tell them that that like that things aren't one hundred percent right or one hundred percent wrong. But there's a lot of of gray area. Um, right. And honestly, if you take the scriptures as a whole, you can see that gray area. Um, it's very nuanced. And yes. how and 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 so we've also then created what we think is sort of like a just and correct society, and these are the laws and stuff. Well, are all of the laws just? Mm. That also will depend on your perspective. Mm-hmm. Well, then what is my whole relationship with with God, with each other, with my neighbor, with the world? What does that now look like if all of that? doesn't feel like it's totally right or totally wrong anymore. What does that look hmm. like if I if I open that up and actually start to think about well, what does it mean when God says that they set the prisoners free? All of them. No asterisks. What does All that mean? How does that break down my own internal systems? And I think that this is the deep, hard question that a lot of people are struggling with. And I think what we can see in our society right now with how polarized that we're becoming is because People don't want to ask that question mm. because they think if they start asking any questions, the whole thing will break down. Yeah. And that's just a real uh, fragile house of cards. If, yeah. if uh, I just feel, I feel sorry for you. If you can't question um, like, like w- your image of God is very small. Yeah. If, if you can't question or struggle or wrestle with, um, well, if you like also, holy scriptures like this. Well, I think also if you don't believe that God is big enough to be able to have love for those that you don't. Mm. Yeah. What is that? Anne Lamott, you, you're pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty, uh, it's a given that you, let me start that again. I think Anne Lamott says something like, you know, you've created God in your own image when it turns out God hates all the same people you do. Yeah. Right. Mm. Mm. I also just, I also think what you were saying before about this nuance, this gray area, it, it requires you to read more than just the Bible bullets. It requires you to have like biblical literacy to see the gray. Yes. And yeah, in some and ways, you know, can I say that, Jason, a little plug? That's actually the reason for this podcast is to talk about our biblical literacy, um, because I think you're right. So I um, I always explain to people and people are like, well, how do I know like what church to go to or, or what I'm looking for, like what to say? Um, I, I always say to uh, what's what's the education of the person that's preaching to you? Not that like people who don't have a specific biblical education cannot be totally inspired and informed um, and be able to speak the word of God. I think what's most important is to understand that like, there's a lot going on that this is this book, we call it book. It's actually a collection of books. Um, It is a collection that was written by hundreds of people over thousands of years um, in different languages that have been written down and rewritten down and re re rewritten down and translated and then translated again um, and then translated again. And all of those people had their hands in, in the product that we read on the end. And so if you take the product that you have, um, whatever, you know, I, I assume the listeners are reading an English Bible as we are speaking in English, you take your English Bible and you say, this is black and white. Well, that doesn't actually make any sense when you think about, you know, also the authors being spread, you know, hundreds of offers over thousands of years, also over thousands of miles and, you know, different family systems and different places of origin, right? Like, yes, they are telling the story of their relationship with the God of Israel. And then subsequently, the God of Jesus, right? But and and that is the inspired, inherent Word of God. But there's more to it than that, you know. There's, there's so much there's, more to it. 
um, and that you have to know the backgrounds and stories of these people in order to understand what's happening, what they're saying, what the message is, who they were talking to, why they were talking to them, what gave right. them the authority to talk to them. You know, like mm. there's just, yes. I always say like, you wouldn't go to a doctor that didn't go to medical school uh. or a lawyer who didn't go to law school. You know, there is just um, as much complicated uh, stuff, you know, in in looking at the Bible. Okay, that's that's my that's my plug. Oh, I love it. Um, just to go with continue with the plug is not just uh, hundreds of different writers, but hundreds of different agendas. Yeah, we don't like to talk about it too much. Oh my God, the Bible can't have an agenda. We all have agendas, but specifically the biblical writers had agendas. Mm -hmm. They had very specific points they wanted to make and very specific images of the divine. And so they, they each have their own agenda. That doesn't make it wrong or bad. I think it makes it much more interesting. Mm -hmm. It just means that we need to take more time. Like you were saying, AJ, we have to, in the words of Marcus Borg, not take this stuff literally, take it seriously. Yeah. Mm. Which because I, taking you know, it literally is never gonna is never gonna work. You take it literally, it's gonna fall. No. It's gonna fall apart like a house of cards. Yeah. Well, also to just say, like, it wasn't meant to be taken literally. No, it wasn't. Um. You know, like when we talk about even just the beginning of Genesis. So Genesis has two different creation stories. Um. In the first uh, three chapters. <laughs> So um, that there were multiple authors that wrote different parts of these stories that actually um, Genesis um, and the subsequent rest of the Pentateuch were actually assembled later than um, a lot of the other uh, Old Testament books because yeah. um, they were compiling their stories. Um, I like to compare right. it. Um, I taught an Old Testament class uh, last fall and I compared it to, you know, Marvel. Marvel's really big into origin stories right now. Yes, they um, are. And so... This is this people. This is their origin story that they wrote down to explain right. how their world, how they came to be, and how their world um, came, you know, into their understanding right. and their relationship with their God through right. that understanding. That's what those stories are meant to be, and they were written down much later. Um, because they're a different kind of story than, you know, some of the more uh, ones that are telling historical parts, the historical books. So, uh, yeah, it's meant to be more instructive and it's meant to make sense of the world in which that they lived in. Yes. And so take all of that. And like you said, AJ, um, the Bible, Bible is a Greek word that is plural <laughs> so it means little books mm -hmm. so we have all these different little books and to get through all of what we've talked about to even read it in its original language you have to have all these different pieces in your mind the context and what was going on and why are they telling the story and that's just to read it in its original language not Once even get it, like which which papyrus are we looking at right like I, there's yeah. multiple version of it right like right. there's Right. Which which random piece of Mark from the from the Qumran and the Dead Sea Scrolls are we reading? Right. Yep. And so to even they're kinda, get they're all, they're slightly different. They are. I mean, uh, uh, you read your Bible, you're going to have a lot of those little uh, notes. And sometimes they'll say things like manuscripts differ. Yeah. Or so other ancient authorities say. Right. That's the way the NRSV likes to write at the bottom. Other ancient authorities say. It's wild. And so once you, and so all that, then imagine the biggest game of telephone you can yeah. ever imagine to get it to the English that we have today. And then we have how many different English translations, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so many. So for anybody, especially an English speaker, to take the Bible and say, it says right here, black and white, so clear, it's hard for me not to laugh in their face. <laughs> But I, I mean, so part of, I think, again, with the reason that like why the podcast is important to me is there's a lot of people that like, that's just what they were taught. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. the, it's the yeah. need to, it's the need to educate and it's the need to spend more time learning. Um, and to, you know, I, I think there's just this, this thing that went around that they're like, well, just put a Bible in their hands. They can read it. Well, 
I, that'd be like, I really do think that'd be like putting the, a, a law library in someone's hands and then being like, oh, yeah, they can figure it out. I think I, I, don't, th- I, I don't think you're far off uh, at all. I think it's very similar. And I also think that you're right. It's not. And, I, and I'll say for me in my story, like um, my faith changed a lot when I felt when I was given more tools, right? Like when I Amen. learned more, you know, you sort of go from that sort of childlike faith where, you know, the, if you go to a church that does those nice concerts on Sunday where you just, you know, you get that feeling, right? Like, and it's, I, I do think the Holy Spirit is present in that. And you know, when you spend more time actually learning and learning the nuances, because I think that faith doesn't hold up to what's the reality of the world, right? And so how do you reconcile this world with a childlike faith? And I I think you either fall apart where you don't have faith anymore or a lot of people do the opposite where they double down on this right. black and white literal thing because again if you poke holes in it then it doesn't make sense anymore and i think that there's a third option right there's learning there's learning more about this journey yes. of god with the people of god and what does that mean? And then how does God manifest in our world today based on what we've learned about God's story with God's people throughout history? And then we start to see where God is present and at work. And, you know, an activist uh, uh, like Pastor L, who was out protesting to help, you know, make this make this uh, pretrial fairness act come into being, come into fruition. Right. Right. This, this, this is where God is at work with God's people. Yeah, it's a much different kind of faith. It is a different kind of faith, and I think you named it. And I, for many of us, we are encouraged to stay in our Sunday school mm-hmm. faith, and God wants more from us, beloved. <laughs> like the Sunday school faith, the black and white, the good guys and bad guys, this whole thing that, that doesn't fly. I mean, I don't even think that we should be teaching kids that, <laughs> but like we, we have, we've dumbed it down for Sunday school and we've never come out from that. Yeah. Generally speaking. Well, cause I mean, so that's the problem. I, I, at least speaking into a, a, a Lutheran uh, issue is that we have struggled with the, with that lifelong learning, with that transforming from, you know, we sort of, we go to, to like eighth grade, ninth grade, right? Like this confirmation. Well, now you're confirmed. You're officially an adult. You don't have to learn anymore. Graduated from church, baby. Yep. You graduated from church and, and that's it. And so then you're right. We don't ever transform, um, you know, break the rosy glasses of some of the actual horrible perspectives and aspects of it. Um, I do like to give this example a lot. And so the listeners are probably tired of hearing it, but the story of Noah's Ark, right? Like that is one of our favorite children's Bible stories. Well, yeah. When you're looking at it as like fun, like, oh, the rainbow and all the cute animals. Well, I mean, like that's one perspective. What's another perspective? All right. I'm the guy at the end standing on the corner flooding and drowning. Right. It's not, it's terrifying. Not a great story anymore. Is it right? Like, you know, so I, I think that, being able to take the Bible, the actual whole Bible in all of the horrors and all of the beauty um, and hold it in tension yes. with itself and to understand how does this, what does this tell us about God and about ourselves? Yes. I mean, in the words of Frederick Beekner, this is your life. This is the world. Beautiful and terrible things will happen. Yeah. You are not alone. Mm. Mm. Also, I just want to say I got in trouble once for uh, uh, in my first call. I got in trouble a lot in my first call, but that was uh, the first place Jason was a pastor after he uh, graduated from seminary and got ordained. Continue. Indeed, I was an associate pastor, and uh, I taught. I told the children in uh, a children's sermon in front of the whole church body about the slaughter of the innocents because that's what the story was. And I got in trouble afterwards. I got called into the principal's office often. But what I said was like, um, I think they should hear this 
And I think they can also handle it. And if you're only going to tell kids, I don't know, happy stories from the Bible, there's not too many of them. Like <laughs> the Bible is I can't really like not. Life. You make a good point. <laughs> And so, like, if we can't trust them with that, I just, I, I think that's a real, that's a shame. Mm. Um, um, so that, uh, Don Blue, Don Bluth, uh, Blythe, Bluth. I, uh, I don't know, Blythe. Uh, I'm sure I'm totally mispronouncing his name. Was a uh, actually over this exact pretty much thing that you uh talked about um left disney so he was um he was a film creator at disney um in the 80s and it was very you know um disney movies were just very happy kind of like you know didn't want to put a lot of hard stuff in there right and so he was like no they can handle it so he left disney and then um started his own uh, film company and made um some films in the eighties that you would be most familiar with that. Like if you watch them as an adult, you're like, Oh my God, I can't believe we traumatized children. <laughs> um, so, uh, so his, his films then would be um, the secret of Nim, um, the land before Great time, uh, uh, the, the original, um, yeah, I don't yeah. think he's responsible for many yeah. of the 25 sequels. <laughs> um, I still have images of the all secret dogs of go to heaven. Uh, uh, it was another one of his, uh, uh um the american tale yeah um which you know these jewish meister is escaping you know uh nazis uh right. you know you talk about uh the land before time right this is like it's there's a lot there's a lot of really hard things like yes. these are more of the darker of the kids movies that came out in the 80s and I and I have talked to people that like have seen them since as adults and I'm like oh my gosh I can't believe that like right we right watched that. right um I, be, because it, it just said he said listen kids can handle the hard stuff and to be honest with you they have to handle the hard stuff because if you don't if you're not able to emotionally work through and process yes. these things as children you're Good not luck when you're an adult. Yeah, you're not going to be able to when you're an adult, right? So, absolutely. We have so, to trust. We have to trust. We have to trust these stories. Mm -hmm. You know. Again, so we talked about it. it's not like just don't you know put a Bible in a kid's hand and you know read about the woman that was raped and chopped into twelve pieces, right? Like, right. It's not where you should start, but say they you know, but but have conversations about the things, like right, like read hard things. And then talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I, I remember I told the kids about the slaughter of the innocents. I said, imagine if you were Jesus and you had friends of yours that you used to play with and then they weren't anymore. Like that's, that's hard. <laughs> I think, I think Jesus struggled with that. Yeah. And, and, you know, they could handle that. And I think also maybe some of the adults had never well, also, I just like to name this too with the amount of mass shootings, especially school shootings, of Listen. shootings of children. Listen. Let's talk about Uvalde and then, uh, you know, this one girl like covering herself in her friend's blood. This is an just elementary to, just school. Just to child. survive. Just to survive, to, to play dead. Can you imagine the trauma? Yeah. Oh my God. So let's not say kids can't handle this. No but kidding. We need to have conversations about it because also, also that kid's going to walk into Sunday school and like they're they're checking out. They're not into this faith anymore. If absolutely. you can't put in perspective what's happened to them in their absolutely. Lives. If you don't have an answer, and I, I mean an answer in a way of like like you're not alone. This is an awful thing that happened to you. Uh, uh, there are ways that that your adults have failed you. Mm -hmm. Um, and there are things that we can do in the future to curb gun violence. If we don't have anything like that, and we just have this sort of like, well, just love Jesus and you'll be fine. Like what? The God won't give you more than you can handle. Mm. God just wanted more angels in the garden. And that included uh, your uh, eight year old classmate. Yuck. Yeah. I know it's, uh, I, there are some words that I can't say to that. I, Jason got his PJ 13. Um, talking to before the That's episode right. started i had to be reminded i think maybe more than other guests <laughs> well last last season you're the only person i had to bleep out I think she's, come on there we go Ooh. anyways we've strayed a little bit from the psalm but maybe not oh um, i don't think so at all mm-hmm
maybe to understand maybe, what this what this God is all about. And that the Psalms Also, don't tell me you're a Christian. Do not tell me that you subscribe to this God. Do not tell me that you believe in the promises and the gifts of Jesus Christ and what it is that we are meant to do as followers of the Son of God. And tell me that you're not um, thinking we should do something so that people can't carry guns into elementary schools anymore. Preach. Or nightclubs because you don't like those people. Yeah, there, there's a difference uh, between uh, we're, we're really obsessed with freedom in this country. There's a difference between free, free, quote unquote, to carry guns and children being free to go to school and not oh, being oh. afraid they don't come home. Yeah. No, no kid should have to go through that. That's it's so it's, that that actually trauma started. I remember um when I was in elementary school was when we started, it was after Columbine that we started doing active shooter drills. Yeah. So yeah. those are, th those are very traumatizing to kids because they have to learn what to do in the event that someone's going to walk in there and start shooting children. I had to <laughs> learn that as a child. That's. So this is, this is 25 years ago and we're still not thinking something needs to change. Also, I want to say, you know, when we talk about it, we have right here, um, you know, uh, that to give justice to the oppressed, to uh, liberate the blind, open the eyes of the blind. We, when we talk about liberation, liberation and freedom are not the same thing. No, they are not. No, they are not. That's a really good point. And that through the whole story of the Hebrew scriptures... God tells Israel, it's because I liberated you from oppression that you are to care for the stranger, mm -hmm. that you are to liberate the oppressed in your own community. And that's the grace you're talking about from our Lutheran understanding. God saves us not just to be able to condescendingly talk to other people about us being saved. God saves us so that we can save the world i mean in some ways yeah well i mean like listen i mean i think the difference is you're looking at the perspective of uh are you is it your job to save are you saving souls for christ or are you loving and caring and for god's people um saving them by grace uh right there in some ways no please go oh no i uh once upon a time in campus ministries, um, a, another campus ministry, not the Lutheran campus ministries, put before these college students um, a choice, uh, a, a parable of sorts that they had to decide what is the moral right and moral wrong. Mm. Um, and that is this. they You walk into a remote village in Africa, a place where they have never heard of God, never heard of Jesus, never heard of Christianity, none of it. And you come across a starving child who's going to die if they don't get food. Do you tell them about Jesus and God and this life-saving thing before they die? Or do you give them food? They're mutually exclusive for some reason. Hmm. What's the right answer? Well, Desmond Tutu would say, there are some people so hungry, God can only appear to them in the form of bread. Mm. I love that. That's beautiful. Well, I want to tell you that um, I, a, a student distraught over this um, coming into Lutheran Campus Ministries, asked more questions from someone else, um, was told, well, bread, obviously, give, give the kid food, right? Right. Like, right. That is not the answer that they were told in this other campus ministries. And so, what does liberation mean? Um, what does it mean to to save people? Um, hmm. Yeah, to me, you know, it's the Holy Spirit's you know job to to save people. Uh, my job is to to feed them, to care for them, to um, liberate them from their oppression. Amen. Which, by the way, I would like to. Uh, 
a, a point to that, um, especially when we talk about person with persons um, who who have um, we we would say uh, you know more differently abled, but a, a common term would be to say that they are disabled, both mentally or or physically, um, with disabilities. Um, that we often, I think, in a generalist society think that to liberate them means to fix right what is wrong uh what it you know because that's a perspective right there's something wrong with you we need to fix it um but if you spend time and learn and grow with um persons who grew up differently abled um or or live in in the world that way they don't see themselves as wrong right and so what does liberation mean in a different um what does liberation mean to them? Amen. Nancy, and to I realize assume. that, you know, like what, if we're re- to, truly doing this work, right? Like liberating doesn't mean fixing them. Right. Mm-hmm. In some ways, liberating means fixing us. Yeah, from a, it from does. A viewpoint yeah. that they're less than. Yeah. I'm thinking of Nancy Iceland, uh, who wrote The Disabled God. And she points out that when Jesus comes back after his public execution, he sh- he doesn't just have his scars he shows yeah. his scars they're not th- they don't they, they don't weren't, uh, they weren't fixed he was yeah right exactly it was it was the in the scars were salvation in some ways like that might be too much but no i yeah god, god is in the the disabled just as in the able and plus uh whatever level of differently abled or disabled for uh someone like me i am just temporarily abled at some point i will be disabled and so will you that's a good point yeah i like that unless we die early i mean like we're going to be yeah 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 wow yeah, I so you know I think about um, you know we talk about all persons being created in God's image. So if someone's yeah. created in God's image, um, you know who are we to say that there's something wrong with you? Right. Um, and then right. beyond that, okay, so like you know God didn't make people wrong. It is not them who is limited. It is us that the it's world us. around them is what is is what is limited. Um, and how can each each of each of these people gift the world? Yes. Um, you know, so maybe liberating them isn't fixing them. It's fixing the world around them, which is essentially, you know, like the history of, mm-hmm. I, I think of like, you know, ADA compliance, right? right? We're fixing the world around someone because it should be, you know? Amen. I mean, I, I really, I really think ADA uh, accommodations are, you know, that, that, corny 1990s what would jesus do i mean i really think jesus would make it w- would look at things from the perspective of those who mm-hmm. struggle to get around and make it easy for them because guess what if we make it easy for them it's easy for everybody mm-hmm. or but it's again, accessible it's, for everybody yeah um an ex- a, a good example of something to to check out um there's a documentary called Crip Camp on Netflix um I was uh, was shared with me uh by a, a good friend of mine who has spent much of uh, her uh, uh, life working with uh and advocating for persons with dis- disabilities yeah um but it is how um these people came together and worked and advocated for themselves and and it wasn't about fixing them. It was about fixing that, that world around them. And it's just, um, yes, it's beautiful. But again, it's understanding from a different perspective, right? Amen. There's an argument for the story of Bartimaeus, Mark chapter 10, that Jesus doesn't just heal him of his blindness. The people around Jesus are healed of their discrimination of like, he's socially outcast. And Jesus brings him in. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I think there are a lot of times like that where the disability isn't what we think it is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sometimes the disability is with us because we can't, we can't see others as being whole and complete. Yeah. Which can, you know, stretch to 
a whole host of things, um, a lot of which, you know, kind of named in the big seven here. Um, but mm-hmm. that, yeah, that it is indeed, it is the world's, the world that needs to be changed. Right, right. Well, uh, Jason, we have just, this has been a quite um, a fantastic conversation today. I agree, um, AJ. Thanks for inviting me. It usually is when I'm talking to you, um, <laughs> which I appreciate. But uh, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, there's a lot to chew on here. Um, maybe, again, uh, a, a little, you know, this is... This is maybe not as deep as you want to get in your December, you know, Christmas ramp up, but I, but I hope that it has been uh, good for our listeners and sort of um, spending some time, um, spending some time just, you know, really thinking about scripture this week. But so thank you so much for, for all of this. It's been fantastic. I agree. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks. And, um, you know. Uh, listeners, uh, if you're just tuning in, um, please, we have lots of other great conversations, including another good one from last season with Pastor Jason. Um, you can learn more uh, at 10 com and find us on Facebook and Instagram at 10 Podcast and wherever you listen to podcasts. Uh, the 10 Foot Pole Podcast is a ministry of the Delaware, Maryland Synod. To learn more, go to demdsynod.org. Uh, thanks so much, and we'll be back with more good stuff next week. Take care.